So, uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to this meeting. And uh, I'm really happy I have a chance to contribute to this session focusing on sequence-specific assignment, also because we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the first triple resonance experiments. And uh, I will uh, focus on our little corner of carbon-13 direct detection. And hopefully I'll manage to uh, show you how these experiments can contribute to the investigation of intrinsically disordered proteins. Indeed, in recent years, we've been assembling a whole set of uh, NMR experiments that range from uh, simple 2D experiments to acquire a snapshot of an IDP. And uh, then, uh, of course, there are a bunch of uh, higher dimensionality experiments to achieve the sequence-specific assignment, as well as some others to detect additional observables that provide structure and uh, dynamic information. And they do have some uh, uh, nice properties to focus on IDPs. So we set them up on our pet protein, which is alpha synuclein, and then uh, uh, tried them out on a number of uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. And what I'm actually really fascinated about is that a lot of somehow common motifs that uh, have not been characterized so much yet, just because they are typical of IDPs, are emerging, so hopefully we can contribute to uh, providing high-resolution information to this uh, fascinating new field. And uh, the major uh, drawback of uh, carbon-13 direct detection is the uh, intrinsic low, uh, lower sensitivity of carbon-13 respect to uh, proton, of course, because of the lower diamagnetic ratio. But uh, fortunately, in the years, um, the instrumentation has largely compensated this disadvantage. As you see, there has been an increase in a factor of more than 10, which means a reduction of a factor of more than 100 in terms of experimental time, meaning that now we can do things we could only think of uh, before. And of course, we're expecting an extra big leap in both sensitivity and resolution by going to higher fields. So, uh, if uh, with uh, on well-behaved, uh, like uh, hundreds of micromolar concentration IDPs, you can get uh, uh, spectra that look like these with carbon-13 direct detection in just, for example, one scan per increment, then why not try to use heteronuclei as much as possible to look at IDPs? Indeed, uh, uh, it's uh, well known, actually opening the first uh, pages of any NMR textbook, one can uh, find that uh, going from protons to carbons to nitrogen-15, the chemical shift dispersion actually increases. And here is uh, what happens if you look at the uh, most promising uh, nuclear, backbone nuclear spins for IDP investigation in alpha c nuclein. And so you can, uh, if you uh, plot the spectra on the same scale in Hertz, you can see that uh, the dispersion increases and, of course, we should make the best use as possible of uh, 15N, as we all do when we start looking at our IDPs by acquiring the proton-nitrogen HSQC. But, of course, then you can also correlate these to carbonyl, to the one-bond coupling, and uh, collect this uh, nice spectra. And uh, if you look at them, you note right away that the resolution is pretty nice, uh, and uh, uh, an additional features that contributes to this is also the inter-residue nature of this correlation. Indeed, it's well known that in IDPs, the covalent nature is the main uh, uh, determinant of the chemical shift dispersion. And so having a, a correlation between two different amino acids contributes to increasing the dispersion. Then we know we can also monitor prolines that do not have the amide proton. And these are, uh, in actually in alpha synuclein, they are just five, but uh, in, uh, they turn out to be very abundant in IDPs, as I will show you also through several examples of the proteins we worked with. And uh, uh, the other uh, major uh, difference that arises in absence of a 3D structure is that uh, uh, backbones are largely exposed to the solvent 
So when you try to study your IDPs and uh, pH and temperature conditions near physiological ones, often uh, at least half of the signals of a mite protons broaden beyond detection. And uh, so you can imagine we were pretty pleased when just by acquiring CON experiments on alpha synuclein with increasing temperatures, we realized that uh, uh, these experiments are actually pretty robust and they can manage to provide uh, high atomic resolution information also in uh, high pH and temperature conditions. And uh, of course, it is because uh, both uh, carbonyl and nitrogen are non-exchangeable nuclear uh, nuclei. And uh, the obvious uh, um, following question is, uh, why don't we try to use uh, another experiment that um, exploits uh, non-exchangeable nuclear spins? And in particular, the most one of the most sensitive ones, the proton carbonate HSQCs. And uh, just uh, if you just uh, uh, take a quick look at this, to the acquire an alpha synuclein, you, uh, it's really difficult to count 140 cross peaks in the uh, H-alpha, C-alpha region because of the effect I mentioned before, they all tend to cluster one on top of each other. So that's why, of course, we run proton nitrogen HSQCs that, uh, however, if you acquire them in exactly the same conditions that I showed you for the CON, the, with increasing temperature, you can tell that uh, the quality somehow is reduced, but maybe not. Maybe we are just uh, going to uh, monitor the, the um, peaks that remain, and maybe this will also tell us information. Maybe it's a, a more protected region or a region with high electrostatic potential. So definitely it makes sense to use uh, all the tools we can, and that's why we uh, tried um, since essentially the CON does need uh, not not uh, impressively long, but still a um, longitudinal relaxation recovery delay of some something in between two seconds and 1.5 seconds, we thought it was time to uh, exploit multiple receivers to just get the HSQC for free. The two experiments indeed exploit different nuclear spins as a starting polarization source. So you just have to take care to uh, restore the carbonyl magnetization for the CON while acquiring your HSQC. And then you should not do compromises. So you just acquire the two experiments in the best conditions for both of them. And um, here are the, our first uh, tests for setup at low temperature and low pH just to make sure we could collect all the signals. And uh, these, uh, they ju just look like the normal ones. The only difference is that they are acquired simultaneously. No one can tell, well, why bother? I mean, the HSQC is so quick. But uh, in uh, several cases of IDPs that are concentrated above like a, a few hundred micromolars, also the CON can be collected with one scan per increment, making it uh, uh, interesting to collect them simultaneously. And uh, however, probably the, um, the most important use of these uh, simultaneous experiments is for samples with limited lifetime or to follow chemical reactions like post-translational modifications. Here I'm just showing you experiments on cell lysates that uh, are, uh, I was surprised myself to see that the CON was working so nicely also in these conditions. And uh, of course, then you can go ahead and try to approach physiological conditions. And there is a bit of a, a loss, but still you can get good spectra. And finally, you can also uh, have a look at the uh, alpha synuclein in whole cells. And uh, in, in, in it, it's interesting to note that in this case, you get uh, an additional broadening, but still you can get exactly uh, information at the same time on systems that evolve. Okay, so uh, the CON is uh, definitely can be applied as a complementary tool to recover information that's not available in HSQC, uh, but sometimes you um, do have uh, all the information also for proton detection, so that's why we thought maybe we could just uh, uh, have a, a more 
a compact version of the CON just by using 15N band selective pulses on the uh, proline regions to collect the extra information and maybe contribute uh, the additional information to other experiments. Again, if you look at alpha C nuclei, you may say it's just five proline, it's not a big deal. But uh, as I mentioned, most of the IDPs we focus on have a whole lot of prolines. Here is an example of a linker of CBT, where out of 207 amino acids, 45 are prolines. So uh, actually looking at prolines becomes uh, uh, relevant. And uh, uh, that's where actually we uh, thought about this more compact version of the CON. And uh, the nice thing is that, of course, you can get a nice resolution in a much shorter time, so making experiments shorter. And then you can think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, eventually using them as a block, not only to look at prolines, but to get additional observables. One of them we tried uh, was just to collect uh, the 15N relaxation rates of uh, proline nitrogens that are shown here, compared with all the others on uh, other amino acids that can be collected with uh, uh, normal conventional experiments. And the nice thing is, look, they, the rates are very small. So they have really narrow lines, which is good news if you want to focus on uh, uh, IDPs that are uh, uh, really um, uh, where the problem is uh, crowding. Here is uh, another interesting observation is that uh, you can uh, already note that some pairs do uh, cluster in specific regions, like this is the proline region of this protein, and you can find the GP pair here, the TP pair here, the VP pair here, and so on. So a fingerprint in this tiny region that is difficult to access with other techniques. Okay, then uh, uh, which are the other uh, simple 2D experiments that we can collect? And here is the CACO, one of the most sensitive ones. And if you look at it, you can tell mm, it doesn't look very resolved, actually. Uh, here we, we can pick up uh, backbone correlations, and uh, we can also uh, monitor correlations of uh, side chains, amino acids that have either uh, a CO um, carboxylate or a CO NH2 group. And uh, however, if you zoom in, uh, look here, you can uh, collect, uh, uh, you can manage to resolve uh, the vast majority of the 18 glycine resonances that are present in alpha synuclein. Or you can zoom into, for example, this uh, region that contains correlation of uh, as aspartate side chains, and the six uh, uh, correlations are all nicely resolved which means that then we can use this as somehow a tool to uh, look at uh, uh, proteins, uh, also zooming into the amino acidic side chains. Of course, uh, uh, when the, the spectra are so crowded, it, just the tiny shifts in the conditions make it hard to recover all the signals and, and figure out, uh, uh, be, be sure of your assignments. So you can, uh, uh, in addition to the CACO, combine it to uh, the other e experiments. I'm just uh, drawing your attention on the side chains. So you can maybe assign them while we sc scroll the slides. Look here in the CBCO, you get the additional correlations with the uh, neighboring uh, carbons. And if you then also get the CCCO, for example, for the long side chains, you get the additional ones that then just with a, a bunch of 2D spectra, essentially these three and the CON, uh, you, one has a very uh, nice, useful and uh, easy tool, essentially to be combined with any uh, assignment that's available in the BMRB and then help to collect uh, this information about also side chains and eventually then move towards uh, uh, physiological conditions in which uh, amide protons are not detectable. Uh, so this, uh, this approach was uh, actually the topic we uh, worked on with Marco and Letizia, and maybe some of you had a chance to uh, listen how we uh, tried to make some use of these experiments to look at the interaction of, uh, how, to look essentially how alpha synuclein 
senses uh, uh, concentration dumps in calcium ions that are uh, relevant for uh, transmission of uh, nervous signals. Well, then uh, the, once we have all the blocks, we can combine them. And uh, uh, for example, assuming we have our CON here, we can uh, resolve them. Uh, we can add an additional dimension and get a set of uh, three uh, dimensional experiments to provide us the interesting information for sequence specific assignment. Of course, borrowing all the nice building blocks that have been uh, developed throughout the years, here is just a scheme of the available experiments for carbon detection uh, to either identify all the spin systems or also get the sequence specific correlations. And these experiments nowadays, we run them in a routine way for any IDP because they are actually the most sensitive ones. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, let me show you a recent example. And this comes from a very enjoyable collaboration with uh, uh, Robert and Borgia. Borgia came to our lab uh, for uh, several months while he was still doing the PhD with this uh, gorgeous sample uh, of osteopontin. And uh, so the first thing we did uh, since assignment uh, was there, but it was still somewhere in like the 70% and uh, prolines excluded. So the first thing we did was to uh, perform these experiments to get the complete assignment. I say complete is like uh, somewhere above 95% of uh, backbone and uh, C beta and sidechain carbons. So, um, but this was somehow expected. So the nice thing I wanted to share with you is that if you go in the prowling region, of course, these uh, we could assign quite uh, easily. But then if you uh, actually go down with your contours, you find a bunch of additional small peaks and they are quite random. So it's not easy to assign them just by analogy. And uh, so we went ahead and uh, actually took the time also to put the proton start on top of this uh, sequence that helped get a little extra sensitivity to see these small peaks. And in addition to uh, follow, following the assignment for the major form, it was fun to also look at these tiny peaks and uh, also uh, achieve the sequence of specific assignment for the minor peaks that turned out, as you may imagine, to be the uh, minor forms of the uh, proline uh, peptide bonds that uh, derive from the uh, cis isomers. So once we have the assignment of both isomers, the trans and the cis, we can just essentially integrate the peaks and report the ratio to get the percentage of the cis isomers. That, uh, as you see, is uh, quite heterogeneous, is not uniform. And uh, if you go and have a look what these uh, orange uh, residues have in common, is that they have a neighbor, uh, they are neighboring an amino acid uh, residue. So Borgia was very fascinated about this and got excited about uh, how uh, this uh, uh, ICH interaction can stabilize the cis isomer. And uh, we also measured 59 relaxation rates and figured that these uh, cis isomers are a bit more compact. But then at this point, we got curious. Can we also uh, achieve some other information besides, of course, chemical shifts that uh, provide the secondary structural propensities and also 59 relaxation rates? And or can carbon detection also contribute something to this nice uh, um, observable that is uh, paramagnetic relaxation enhancements that are generally uh, determined upon uh, insertion of a paramagnetic uh, tag inside an IDP at uh, selected positions. So what is uh, routinely done by now is uh, collecting uh, uh, proton detected experiments in general proton nitrogen HSQCs to uh, see who is in the neighborhood of the paramagnetic tag 
only the residues in, in, in nearby in the primary sequence, or maybe also we can pick up some long-range compact. And uh, why not try also to see if the carbon-detected experiments can uh, provide some additional information. And uh, here is, uh, of course, we chose to uh, for use uh, our favorite experiment, the CON, actually shown here. And uh, Borgia decided to plot the zoom. And uh, you can also collect these experiments, several variants, either starting from carbon, carbonyl or H-alpha or H-N, somehow modulating a bit the extent of paramagnetic effects one will pick up in the experiments. So just by collecting them on a diamagnetic and paramagnetic analog, you can see there are selected uh, uh, peaks that disappear that will tell us about uh, uh, who is in the vicinity of the paramagnetic tag. Uh, that uh, has been inserted, for example, here in, at position 108, so you can see that uh, the, there is the usual dip and, uh, and uh, the three variants are actually our tests with carbon start, H alpha start or HN start. So you can see that uh, the dip is there, is a bit more narrow in the carbon, but that's probably not so interesting. So what is interesting is these other two dips that tell us that there are some long range contacts between our region 108 and these regions over here. So the final, the, the final uh, observation we can do is that uh, uh, actually, of course, uh, these uh, experiments uh, are, um, these are um, more complete in the sense they also report uh, um, data about uh, prolines and uh, they can also be uh, applied in conditions in which HN are not observable. And finally, since uh, we already had a look at the minor forms, uh, we can also go and look at these effects. Here are the four tags uh, available, and the gray data are the ones on the ma major form. The green ones are on the minor form. So we can also go and have a look at some long-range information in uh, the both uh, conformers. I hope I will be able to tell you more about this in the uh, uh, next occasion. Um, and uh, up to here, we essentially did, uh, could manage to do all the job, the assignment and the investigation uh, using only 3D experiments. But uh, what happens if uh, now uh, the 3Ds are not enough? Uh, for example, for studying um, IDPs uh, that have uh, maybe more than 300 amino acids, then they overlap maybe even low complexity regions. So the overlap may become uh, too much also for uh, the 3Ds. And uh, uh, so we thought, let's give it a try. Let's uh, try to see if we can manage to um, go to higher dimensions. And uh, I was uh, the most skeptical to focus on this because for me, these 5Ds, 5D objects are a bit difficult to digest. But actually, these three guys convinced us to, to try out. And uh, indeed, uh, um, Victor was uh, convincing me that in the end, we always look at uh, um, our spectra, breaking down, them down into lower dimensional objects. For example, when we look at 3Ds, we always look at slices, no? So if uh, we can accept this, then it's not uh, difficult to... Uh, imagine how we can deal with 4Ds. We can just uh, imagine, uh, for example, a 2D, either a peak in the HSQC, if it were proton detected, or in the CON. And then for each peak, you can imagine to process out the additional information to get the extra two correlations encoded in this peak. For the 5D, the basis spectrum uh, it can be a 3D, and then you can do the same kind of uh, thinking. And of course, if you encode five frequencies in a peak, the, the possibilities of accidental overlap uh, decrease. And also this approach allows us to get an impressive resolution in all the indirect dimensions, even in these uh, 4D and 5D objects, because only the uh, part of the spectrum where one has signal are processed. 
all the noise is left because it's not interesting, of course. So here is, um, let me show you the example we focused on. This is our basis spectrum, we chose a CACON. And uh, for each cross peak, then you can process out uh, the additional two dimensions which provide two cross peaks, which are the two neighboring uh, uh, peptide bonds. And these are several variants of the experiments that uh, Ale like to call the Concon strategy. And so essentially by pulling out the planes, you can then just correlate pairs of uh, peptide uh, bonds and then walk in a sequential way throughout your protein. But let me show you some real data. So here is uh, our basis spectrum. It's the 3D, but I prefer to report on the slide the 2D so it's easier to follow. And then let's focus on a peak. And then let's try, let's uh, transform the plane in the fourth and fifth dimension, and uh, uh, which is this white spectrum, so these two cross peaks, which I show you on top of the reference CON spectrum reported in blue. So essentially, it's very easy to assign the neighboring amino acids. There are just two. And then you can go ahead and process out again the fourth and fifth dimension from the new peak, and then you get the additional one. And while I scroll this, I would draw your attention on the excellent resolution of these white peaks that are the peaks in the fourth and fifth dimension that was possible thanks to these non-uniform sampling strategies and the processing uh, uh, with the tools developed by Victor. And these spectra were so nice that I didn't resist to just put in a bunch of uh, slides just to, so you can have a look at uh, a, how, how, how nice uh, the process is if, of course, we manage to get uh, good spectra. And uh, the other approach that uh, has been proposed in the literature is to use projection spectroscopy that uh, we tested, uh, stimulated by Wolfgang, who was uh, very interested in this subject. And again, I was uh, not familiar with this, so I resisted in the beginning. But uh, uh, if, uh, um, I mean, um, once you sit in front of the spectrometer, generally to set up your 3D, you collect uh, the first planes of your uh, 3D, and this is accepted by everyone, no? incrementing either one dimension or the other. So why not just increment two dimensions at the same time and you will end up with uh, some kind of transverse uh, slices. That uh, is, uh, is actually the essence of the projection spectroscopy. Uh, you can get as many slides as you like, and of course you want to extend this idea to a 5D, then it's easy. You will just have four orthogonal projections, and uh, then you can design as many uh, other projections as you like. So let me show you exactly on the same experiments as I mentioned before, how this looks. And I thought it was really cute. Look, here is a, well, the first orthogonal dimension that looks very much like the CON. I hope now you recognize these five prolines in alpha synuclein. Then you can get the correlation between nitrogen and carbonyl intra-residue, a bit more crowded, but still uh, well resolved. Then you can also correlate the C prime and C prime that has this some kind of pseudo-diagonal, and uh, finally also the CACO correlation. So uh, after collecting these four projections, you can plug in and you get spectra that look uh, um, different and that, uh, of course, uh, provide you the information to uh, collect these uh, 5D peak lists. So the output, thanks to some programs developed by this, um, available by Sebastian Hiller, uh, the, these five peak lists uh, provide now the information for sequence-specific assignment. Here is a uh, CON peak and here is another CON peak that are uh, neighbors. And then it's quite easy to uh, inspect this by loading this peak list on the 2D. And again, you can walk through the backbone. Okay, so I think, I hope this shows you a bit an overview of how these uh, experiments uh, can contribute to the study of IDPs. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, 
I hope they can be of use to look into um, novel uh, modules that are not studied uh, yet so much. Like, uh, uh, for example, uh, just to briefly mention what we've been working on, uh, one topic that I think is really interesting is looking at all these flexible linkers. Here is a CBP. Uh, it has more than 2,500 amino acids, and many of the globular domains are available in the uh, PDB, uh, characterized by NMR and X-ray. But uh, actually, these account only for about half of the amino acids, as the remaining half is disordered and is divided into what we like to call uh, intrinsically disordered linkers with an increasing number. And uh, in collaboration with uh, Peter Pompa and uh, in particular with Sara and uh, Simone, we focused on uh, three of them for the moment, the ID3, ID4, and ID5. And without boring you with details, the emerging picture is that uh, they all have their own personality. Like this is super disordered, this is uh, uh, has this, um, alpha helices that are populated, this has a poly Q fragment. So uh, we're beginning to uh, at least provide the grounds to understand also their role. And another example I really like is that of the androgen receptor that, as you see, is a huge uh, protein in which uh, uh, actually we focus on this embarrassingly small fragment of 135 amino acids in the beginning. And uh, this fragment actually is the most relevant one for um, one of these neurodegenerative diseases, spinal bulbar muscular atrophy. And uh, here are, is uh, the usual idea of the protein with the HN and the CON. And uh, the disease arises when this fragment of 4Q increases all the way to a higher number. The, the highest we could study is uh, the 25Q because with a, a larger number, it would aggregate so fast and it could not stay in the tube for long enough to be studied. And uh, in this case, uh, just by overlapping these two variants, the 4Q and the 25Q, one realizes that there is this sort of pseudo-diagonal that's appearing in HSQC and in the cone. You can zoom in, here it is. And uh, actually, uh, I was very skeptical, but we could uh, also, thanks to uh, the patients uh, and the skills of uh, Ale, assign the whole fragment of the 25 cues that are reported here. And... Uh, well, the, the, um, the nice, uh, I mean, the really surprising uh, observation was that uh, this fragment of 25 cubes actually adopts a helical conformation, as you can see by this sort of shark fin here. And, uh, and this was surprising to me because why on earth, uh, if this thing tends to aggregate, are we finding an alpha helix? And uh, chatting with uh, Xavier, uh, then, uh, and the thanks also to a student who went for Erasmus to join their lab for a while, we thought to actually chop off these uh, four leucines in the beginning of this polycule fragment to have a look whether they do have a role in inducing this helical element. And uh, uh, the result was quite striking. As you see, when uh, these four leucines are chopped off, this pseudo-diagonal, that's the symbol, the, the, the signature of the poly Q helis, is actually uh, gone. So essentially, these uh, four leucines are very important in inducing a helical conformation in the following amino acids. And uh, uh, so what, what we thought is that uh, these uh, four Qs can have a role in somehow uh, protecting uh, uh, are the amide uh, protons of this long polycule in the form of this dull structural element as the alpha helix. So uh, essentially, they will have less chance uh, uh, respect to being uh, extended to interact with other molecules and then form the highly stable aggregates that are fibrils. Of course, this protection role works as long as the helix, the, the, the fragment doesn't become too long and then that uh, could be a reason why uh, 
with a very uh, a higher number of cues, uh, the, the protein then uh, tends to aggregate too fast. And finally, the last comment, look, but that's by, from the proton nitrogen HSQC of different proteins. Here is the one I just showed you. But uh, if you look at another fragment of uh, CBP, you can find, uh, again, this little helix, this little uh, sort of diagonal. And in a third protein, is less pronounced, but somehow it's still there. And uh, if you look at the assignment, once these proteins were assigned, here is the assignment. This is our 25Q preceded by four leucines. Here is, again, a poly-Q preceded by two leucines and another polycule preceded by, this time, a bunch of alanines. So maybe a novel module that uh, is not being investigated so much, but it's very interesting. So with this, I would like uh, to thank a lot uh, uh, my, um, the people I've been interacting with, in particular Roberta. As you know, we share this uh, project since many years. And the number of students that we had the chance to interact with throughout the years. Of course, Wolfgang, Wolfgang and Reiner, who uh, we are always, with whom we're always in contact. And uh, then a number of people we had a chance to meet through these um, programs of access to research infrastructures. By the way, please keep an eye on these programs in case, uh, because they provide support uh, uh, in case you want to uh, come and visit the CERM and uh, try out some of the, these experiments uh, on your own samples. And then my heart still is uh, uh, very linked to the IDP by Mark project that, uh, of course, initially stimulated all this work uh, on IDPs. And thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>